There have been few parts of my life that I remember in specific, lifelike detail. I'm not sure of this to be a blessing or a curse, as there are moments of my life I wish to forget completely. The most significant of which was the play. I'm being quite vague when I say the play, as I've seen plenty of stage shows in my lifetime. Presentations in the form of movies usually bore me, but there was something about the stage that just made a show different. Live actors, so long as they were good, made the experience much more real to me. And ever since I saw my first stage play as a young boy, I was hooked. I moved to the city and saw shows whenever I could. Some stage plays can be quite expensive, but money was never an issue for something I loved. However, I was specifically drawn in when I saw the poster for The Hearts of the Young. I had seen the poster for the show on the streets, not too far from the popular stage theatre in my city. What attracted many to this performance was that it was free. Sure, this brought on assumptions that it would be terrible, but who doesn't enjoy free entertainment? The show was being presented by the Masked Midnight Players, who I had never heard of. I had done some research on them prior to the show, but I couldn't find any information, which gave me the notion that they were a rather new group. Something I should mention before I go on is that the posters for the show became quite numerous. As the night of the show grew closer, it seemed as if I couldn't stroll down a single block without seeing an ad stating, The Hearts of the Young, free show this Saturday. I know that a group should have the right to make themselves known, but it got a bit ridiculous in my eyes. They placed ads on cars put flyers in every mailbox possible, and even put posters up on visible but private property. This started to become a nuisance to some until the day of the show finally came. The posters must have had an effect, because word of the show had clearly got out. Despite the fact that the show started at a late time of 10.30pm, the theatre was still rather crowded. Not as packed as I've seen it at other shows, but certainly more so than the average night. Since the show was free, it had no problem attracting its crowd. Even still, I wasn't at the highest expectations for the production's quality. The time was 10.30, and the lights dimmed throughout the theatre. Normally, a show would have a form of introduction at this point, but this show skipped it as the curtains immediately opened to a lit stage. The set for this scene was just a woman character sitting on a chair in center stage. The woman wore a bright yellow dress, white gloves and black high heels. This would all appear to be normal aside from what she was wearing on her face. A pink mask that presented the face of a woman with a repulsing amount of makeup. The mask didn't look professionally made, as in its makeup details were poorly smeared across, like it had been done in five minutes. The actress just sat in the chair, on stage for about ten seconds, staring at the audience, and then began to softly sob. Throughout the scene, the woman would appear to quickly glance to the left off stage, looking at something or someone. It didn't look like it was intended for the show, as she would turn back quickly as if she had done something wrong. This all happened for about 30 seconds, with her sobbing growing louder at random intervals. I was about to leave the theatre right there until the curtains closed abruptly for the next scene. The audience looked around in confusion. This was clearly going to be a poorly done play, but it was also going to be a rather strange one, which caught the attention of most. I had half a mind to not waste my time, 
but I thought I might as well see what else the production had to offer. The curtains opened again to reveal a scene very similar to the last. The same masked woman was sitting in a chair, crying. There was another actor though, who appeared to be male, so I'll address him as such. He wore a black formal suit with a red and yellow tie that appeared to be very out of place for the rest of his outfit. He was masked too, but he wore a large gas mask as opposed to the female in the chair. He was just standing behind the woman and the chair with his arms in front of him. Because of the mask, one obviously couldn't see his face, but I could sense a sort of expression on it regardless. It felt like he was anticipating something, occasionally looking down at the woman with intent. The stage was like this for about 20 seconds, then the curtains closed once again. At that moment, I had decided I was done. The show was different, sure, but I'd seen better places I could waste my time. I was making my way to the exit when the curtains opened to a completely different scene. The set change seemed way too fast, for the curtain was only closed for a few seconds before opening again. Everyone gasped at the sight. The same woman was on the stage, still in the chair, except she wasn't sobbing anymore. She was screaming. The dress that the woman had been wearing was torn, with some visible cuts to her skin on her legs and torso. She was tied to the chair, and her scream sounded muffled as if something was covering her mouth behind the mask. Around her were more actors and actresses, eleven in total, though it was hard to distinguish which ones were female or male. They all wore formal attire, similar to the gas mask man, who was now sitting at a piano near the left side of the stage. The characters around the girl also wore masks, ranging from strange to downright hideous. The best way to describe them would be greatly disfigured faces, not torn apart, but arranged in completely inconceivable ways. Some had noses placed on the forehead, with large, bloodshot eyes placed where a mouth should be. Others didn't have certain facial features at all, with just mouths or eyes scattered about. Their heads were all turned to the girl in the chair, in a manner of eager anticipation, if I had to guess. The gas mask actor looked at each one of the men and women surrounding the girl, and then looked into the audience. Then, he began to play the piano. He played an overly upbeat and obnoxious jingle tune. I haven't heard it before in my life, but it sounded very similar to a sort of annoying Christmas melody one would hear on the radio constantly. I only heard the specifics of the song for a moment, as the curtains closed a few seconds later. As the curtains were shut, the music still played, but it was drowned out by a series of stomps, then sounds of struggle. It was a barrage of noises that all happened in a short time, so sorry if I'm not being very specific, but the woman's screams were louder than any time before. There were sounds of the chair breaking to pieces, then the ambience of a crowd pushing and shoving each other. The audience began to gasp and scream themselves, as there were very faint sounds of ripping, gnawing, and an occasional aggressive growl from somebody behind the curtain. The woman's scream stopped only after a minute, perhaps less. Everybody in the theater was completely silent. Nobody knew what to think of what the point of this production was, or if it even was an actual production at all. 
I was only hoping that it was some sort of organized joke or a startlingly good show designed to make a sort of sadistic point. The piano tune still played before the next scene opened up, or what was left of it. The curtain opened to an empty stage, with a gas mask actor still at the piano. There were bloody pieces of the chair on the center of the stage, with more red smears all around it. Aside from what appeared to be blood, there was no trace of the woman who was sitting there before. The gas mask man finished playing, and then walked center stage. Then he looked at the stunned audience, bowed formally, and exited to the right of the stage. The curtains closed, and everybody was left silent. I suppose everyone was just as hopeful as I was to see some sort of conclusion to this so-called show. But there was none. Once the gas mask man left, that was it. The theatre was filled with panicked whispers and calls to family and police. The police arrived quickly, did a quick investigation and evacuated the theatre. The theatre was closed for more than a month after the incident. I had no intentions of seeing another show for a while anyway. Following the night of the show, I, of course, had some nightmares, as I imagined the entire audience did. I still clung to speculations that the show was still some sort of setup, made to scare its audience in the most realistic way possible. I almost fully believed this, until the authorities finally released a report on the incident. The crying and screaming woman, the one in the chair, was no actor. She was a woman who had gone missing shortly before the show. She had only been missing for a few hours, so there had been no reports of her missing. Nobody was able to identify her because of the mask she was wearing on the stage, and her muffled voice was assumed to be because of some sort of mouth gag. The blood left on the stage was confirmed to be her own. The actors involved with the production have not been identified. When the police searched backstage after the show, no traces of the suspects were found, aside from a single note placed on the exit. The hearts of the young always taste best. You know who we are. We're the ones who sit in the back, in the corner. We don't talk much. We don't ask you how your weekend was. We don't discuss the weather. We don't care. You all know one. You're thinking of them now. That person who sits behind you in class. That co-worker in the corner desk who never talks to you. That neighbor who rarely comes out of their house. You all have one in your life. Please do not confuse us with the other ones. The creepy ones. The ones who hit on you repeatedly. The awkward ones who try too hard to make you like them. They are not us. No. I'm talking about the people who you don't even notice are there. You don't notice when we're there, and you don't notice when we're not there. The invisible ones. We come and go as we please, and you have no idea. We don't talk to each other if that's what you're thinking. This isn't some secret network or club. We don't have meetings. We don't send group emails. There isn't a sub for us. We're just here. We just watch. We just think. We just plan. We all do know each other, however. I don't mean personally. I mean when we walk past each other in the street, in the hallway, in the office. We know. 
we recognize each other. There are no nods or winks. We don't high five. We just look into each other's eyes and know. Some of us team up, though most don't. The ones who do, however, almost never make it through. We're just better on our own. Don't ask me why, because I don't know. I don't know why we're like this. I stopped thinking about it many years ago. After the first one. After that, I didn't care anymore. I didn't need an explanation. After that moment, for the first time in my life, I liked being me. I was 16. I had felt out of place my whole life. I had friends, but I wasn't interested in them, and they weren't interested in me. In school, I was invisible. I never got bullied, but wasn't a popular kid either. I was there physically, just not mentally. I was always off somewhere else in my head, having some grand, horrid adventure. I lived in my head. I overthought everything. I worried about everything. I was giving myself cancer. I was sure of it. My dad left before I met him. My mom was a secretary for a local optometrist and made enough money for us to live comfortably. Our little life was fine and dandy, except for one thing, one large, sweaty thing. Her boss, Dr. Jeffrey King. He liked my mom. A lot. Too much. More than she liked him. She made the mistake of dating him when she first started. A mistake both of them would eventually regret. Him more than her. When she broke it off, he started to get aggressive. It started with late night calls and texts. Then eventually, he started showing up drunk, screaming in our front yard for my mom. Then our house was broken into, and only my mother's room was trashed. We knew it was him, but there was no proof. The next day, my mom put in a two weeks notice. I begged for her to just not go back, but she wanted to do the right thing. No one ever does the right thing. I started going to her office after school, in fear he might hurt her. I wasn't going to let that happen. He never looked at me while I was there. He only looked at her. One day, while my mom was getting ready to go home after work, I broke into the filing cabinet. She was in the back room, so I knew I had a few minutes. I found the names and numbers of several previous secretaries, and that night, I called all of them. He had done this before. He liked to prey on secretaries. They all told me similar stories. One ended much worse than the others. One woman ended up in the hospital after she was brutally abused on her way home from the office. She stated to the police that it was the good doctor, but for some reason, no charges were filed. Later, King told me he had done work for the chief of police and that they had become golfing buddies. The woman said she had always turned down his advances, and the attack happened the last day of a two weeks notice. Tomorrow was my mom's last day. The decision made itself. About 24 hours after I hung up with a woman, I was sitting in King's office. He wasn't sitting though, I'm sure it would have been too difficult to find a chair, since I'd burned out his eyes with his own LASIK machine. That one was funny. I taped him to the bench and pried his eyelids open using fish hooks. The hooks were attached to wire, which I stapled to the back of his head, so his eyes would stay open. I taped down his head too, didn't want that laser to burn anything other than those baby blues. Then, I turned on the machine and took a seat. The shrieking started very quickly. 
I had to tape his mouth shut so it would stay quiet. Surprisingly, he managed to get the tape off before I could sit back down. After taping all around his head, I took a seat and began to explain myself. He didn't recognize me apparently, so I explained who my mother was, about the woman I talked to, blah blah blah. Let's just say, by the end of it, he knew why this was happening. I adjusted his head so the other eye was in the beam. After a few more minutes, I turned off the machine. I didn't want his eyes to get infected, so I poured a bottle of rubbing alcohol in them. He didn't like that either. Delaying the inevitable, I ripped the tape off of his mouth and asked him a few questions, to which he had some very interesting answers. Through sobs, he described the things he'd done to women in the past. It sounded like a confession. A confession only a monster would ever tell a priest. I had been fantasizing about what was to come next all my life, yet I was nervous. My heart was racing now. I was sweating and my hands were shaking. Don't judge me, it was my first time. I didn't have any of my tools yet, and all I had with me was an old military bayonet I had found in a garage a few years back. My mom never said where it came from, but I knew it was my father's. For a moment, while the good doctor spoke, I studied the blade. There was a small triangle scratched into the base, and there was something black that had drooled down from the tip and dried. Mid-confession, I stabbed Dr. Jeffrey in the throat, just to the right of his jugular. He bled a lot and kept trying to take deep breaths. As he squirmed and gurgled, I dug the blade in even deeper until I felt his spine. After watching him pour all over the floor, I went home. My heart wasn't racing, I wasn't sweating, my hands weren't shaking. I became me that night. Good stuff, huh? You should take comfort in the fact that not all of us are like me. We're all different. We don't all kill or torture or abuse or maim or stab or shoot or kidnap. We all have our own thing. We all have our own needs. Some of us just feed them in different, less murdery ways. Some find comfort in alcohol or drugs. Some of us like to steal. Some of us like to unscrew handrails on handicap ramps and sit back and watch. I once saw a story in the news about a janitor who worked the night shift at a small Catholic church. Every night he would clean the bathrooms, wipe down the pews and jack off into the holy water. You see, we all have our own thing. If this is all news to you, rest assured, you're not one of us. Be thankful for that. Consider yourself lucky. Cherish your normal life. Do not take it for granted. We sure don't. We don't want to be like you. Maybe before our firsts we did, but not after. No, after. We considered ourselves lucky to not be like the rest of you. Blessed is a word I think you people use quite often. Some of us don't feel the same way, however. Some of us hate being us. They just haven't had their first yet, and that's very understandable. Some of us are late bloomers. Some never bloom at all. It's very sad when they don't understand what they are and don't understand how to reach their full potential. They must feel so lost and hopeless inside, a feeling that probably never goes away. They try to fill their lives with something meaningful, but nothing ever sticks. They look for their calling in traditional careers, but they hate their job. They look for love, but love always leaves them. They turn to the superficial, Maybe lots of followers on Twitter, 
or lots of friends on Facebook. None of those people are real friends though, but they know that. They end up staying home where it's safe. They can't get hurt at home. They stop trying, stop letting people in. People just hurt you and leave you. This is the stage where most will remain until they die, whether naturally and alone or by their own hands and alone. If this is at all hitting very close to home and describes your life, congratulations, you're one of us. Welcome, the water is warm, just jump. To the rest of you, all I can say is this, watch. That person who sits behind you in class, that co-worker in the corner desk who never talks to you, that neighbour who rarely comes out of their house, watch them. Watch them because they may be like me, or they may be much worse. They may not be a bloomer, in which case you'll never have to be that person in the news after a horrific event saying, he was such a nice guy, very quiet. And most importantly of all, watch them, because they are watching you. My 12 years of school had finally come to an end. Senior year, with its numerous college, federal financial aid, and scholarship forms was over, and there was a universal sigh of relief among my class as graduation neared. The time had finally come where I didn't need to give a damn about school anymore, and in response to this, my friend William and I began to make plans for a weekend-long canoe trip up on the Allagash River on northern Maine. We were avid canoers and fly fishermen, spending last summer fishing up the mountainous Wrangler Lakes region. William and I had been planning this trip for quite some time, and with a phenomenal weather forecast this weekend, we had a perfect window of opportunity. Directly after school that Friday, I drove over to Will's house, having already packed up my things and picked him up. He had overpacked, as usual, bringing two large backpacks. One of these was dedicated to food and socks, socks being especially important to William. He had once forgotten extra socks on a Boy Scout camping trip, and ended up wearing the same pair for three days. You can never bring too many socks, he always told me, being one of the many mantras he had adopted throughout the years. Will was funny in that sense, and I admired him for it. We left Bangor around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and made our way up the long stretch of Interstate 95. In Maine, there's a point on this highway where all civilization seems to disappear in a flash. Between the cities of Bangor and Holton, where we were headed, there's basically nothing but land owned by paper companies. Locals call this area of the state the Northwoods, and that's exactly what it is. Miles of practically untouched wilderness. An idea that had always intrigued William and I. In these long stretches of forest, you could find numerous natural gems hidden from the eyes of the world. I always thought that some of these places might be better off undiscovered, kept secret in the forest forever. After exiting I-95, we navigated Holton and eastwards into the bumpy backroads of Aroostook County. It was around 6 o'clock at night now, and the sun was beginning to set in the pink sky. Will had since fallen asleep, his head jostling around as we drove through the poorly maintained dirt roads. Our campsite wasn't too far away, and we would spend the night here before making our way to the Allagash tomorrow morning. We reached the campsite at 7 o'clock exactly. It wasn't one of those big public campsites that you see full of tents and campers. 
but a simple one acre lot containing a fire pit with brown wooden benches and an old lean-to in need of major repairs. Overall, the site was very remote and the only things you could hear were the peeping of frogs and the sound of wind hitting the branches of trees. Will and I hopped out of the truck, set our things inside the lean-to and hung our bear bag in a nearby tree. Clouds were coming into the sky and the sun was now barely glowing through them. Dude, check this out, Will said, having strayed off to the perimeter of the campsite. He had been exploring with his flashlight as I got the fire started. What is it? I asked. I think it's a trail or something, he replied, pointing to what appeared to be a narrow, seemingly forgotten stretch of trail that extended into the forest. An old sign with a paint chipping off of it was sitting in front of the trail ahead. I crouched down to see if I could read the sign, and Will pointed the flashlight towards it. The lettering seemed to be in the same font as the words seen on the alpacan trail signs. I could barely make out the word, hey no bog, as I slowly deciphered the carved letters. Curious, Will and I made our way down the thin trail, pushing through the brush. The ground soon became saturated with water, and I could barely make out the extensive meadow of sedges through the trees and darkness. The evening wind seemed to be swaying them back and forth, a motion that I found almost hypnotic. Look at that, I said to Will, noticing the sheer size of the bog. It seemed to extend far into the distances on all sides, creating a sort of aquatic prairie. The trail ended on what appeared to be an old, rotting dock. It jutted out into a small pond, which paved through the center of the bog, getting narrower as it went deeper into the wetland. Will shined his flashlight around the area, trying to get some kind of perspective over the landscape. I don't think I've seen anything like this before, he told me. It's huge. I know, I replied, staring out into the distance. I felt oddly drawn to this area. Something about it had struck me. The way the sedges moved with the wind, and how the black, calm waters sat stagnant in the dark, created an almost interesting feeling inside of me. I don't know if it was curiosity, fear, or even a sense of inner peace, but it felt as if the landscape was drawing me into itself. I squinted my eyes, trying to take in every detail of my surroundings. As I turned my head, I noticed something odd in the distant sedges. Something was rustling around, and for a split second, I saw what appeared to be a black figure rise up from the grass. Immediately, I blinked, and the hazy figure disappeared. I attributed this only to the darkness playing tricks on me, not thinking much of it. Hey, Eric, are you alright? Will asked, noticing that I was staring off into space. Yes, yes, I, I'm fine, I replied waking up from my days, brushing off the illusion I had just seen. You want to take the canoe out on this? The water's pretty calm, and I'd like to explore a bit. I hesitated at first, the image of the dark figure briefly resurfacing in my mind, but I again dismissed it. Sure, I replied a sense of excitement overtaking what had originally been more comparable to dread. It was around 8 o'clock at night when Will and I set off into the stagnant, black waters of the bog. We'd attached the flashlight to the bow of the canoe with a lashing, and it illuminated a good chunk of the landscape as we began rowing. I was sitting on the stern end of the craft, steering while William sat on the bow end, 
leading the way through the darkening landscape. For a wetland, it was oddly silent as we moved deeper into the open, narrowing pond. The peeping frogs we had heard before now remained quiet, and the slight wind silently brushed over the sedges. The only audible sound were our paddles breaching the surface of the water. An odd, uneasy feeling began to surge through my body, sending a shiver through my spine. But at the same time, I couldn't help but admire the eerie surroundings. Will seemed unaffected, occasionally running his hand through the water. Not much longer after we set off, we approached what appeared to be a wall of sedges. After getting closer with a flashlight, we soon realized that the pond separated into two narrow paths, one to the left and one to the right. Which one do you want to take? I asked Will. Are you sure we should go on? He replied, having taken on a more cautious approach to our excursion. I mean, it's getting pretty dark, and we left everything alone on the campsite. I want to make sure the bear bag hasn't been raided by anything. I took note of William's concerns, but conflicting feelings in my mind began to surface once more. An unexplainable urge to keep going took hold, and I responded to my friend in a calm and collected fashion. My campsite's fine, Will. I made sure the bear bag was hung the right way, and everything else is still locked in the car, and I just put new batteries in the flashlights, so there's no need to worry about anything. He nodded, considering what I had to say. Uh, Alright. Let's take the left, he responded after a bit of hesitation. His originally explorative nature seemed to be faltering somewhat, but not to the point where I was concerned. As he began to paddle again, I looked back in the direction we came. A dense fog was swallowing the landscape, obscuring my vision. I said nothing to my friend, even sensing myself smile at the mist not understanding why. We continued paddling into the left passage, bumping into the wall of sedges as we entered. Our canoe had a bit of difficulty navigating through the constant twists and turns, the starboard and port ends constantly bumping into the grass and mud. Will would constantly stop paddling and look around, my silence unnerving him even more. I hadn't spoken ever since we stopped to decide which way to go. The fog was beginning to overtake us, and Will had taken notice. Eric, he said, turning around towards me. Eric, we need to turn around, okay? I can't see anything, and it's going to be difficult getting back. Come on, let's go back. You take the bow end, and I'll take the stern. I looked at him silently, the urge to move on now flaring in my body. It was as if the surreal bog landscape was getting to my head, to a point where my actions were becoming uncontrollable. Frustration took a hold of my mind. Will, we're fine, alright? I said, trying to keep my agitation to a minimum. Let's just keep going, okay? An angered look took over his face. Are you kidding me right now? Eric, we can't see five feet in front of us, and we've been moving through this goddamn channel for over 40 minutes now. We're going back now. I stared at him, a crooked smile forming over my face. He didn't understand. We're fine, Will, I said, almost casually. What the hell is wrong with you? He yelled, the echo resounding over the bog. You haven't said the word for the entire time we've been out here, and why are you smiling? He looked somewhat concerned about me, but my concern for him had been decreasing as we progressed through the bog. 
My only goal now was to press deeper into the foggy wetland. Eric, let's go back, okay? We need to get some rest for tomorrow. No, I replied almost immediately, my calm, detached tone still present. I continued to stare at him in his frustration. I felt myself superior to Will in some unexplainable way. For Christ's sake, Eric, we need to- No! I screamed in a voice very alien from my own. My casual tone had now turned into a deep, almost demonic roar. Will looked absolutely horrified. His body had completely frozen, his eyes and mouth wide open. Eric, what's going on? He asked, his voice trembling. What? What was that? Anger took me over like an ancient instinct, and I forcefully made my way to the front of the canoe, almost tipping it in the process. Will grabbed onto the side of the canoe, leaning backwards as I got right into his face. We will keep going, I said to him in an agitated, raspy whisper, and you will not get in my way. Got it? What's happening to you? William asked, almost in tears as fear took over. We're canoeing the Allegesh tomorrow, Eric. That's why we're here, remember? I instantly slapped William right across the face, his childish stalling getting the way of my goals. I could feel the wind blowing faster through the ominous fog the sedges silently bending back and forth. My rage was growing, and it was dismissing my past friendship with William. He didn't understand, yet at the same time, I didn't understand either. The surreal movements of the bog made it seem as though we were one living, breathing organism. It was enticing me further into its own mind, through its own meandering, confusing channels of thought. Angered, Will lunged at me, violently rocking the canoe back and forth. He tried tackling me, but as a result, the craft tipped over upside down, forcing Will and I into the murky, dark waters. It was much deeper than I had originally thought the turbid water going over my head. Everything seemed to happen in slow motion. The swamping of the canoe, my own body being submerged under water. I remained under there for what seemed like minutes, far longer than I can hold my breath. I opened my eyes, looking into the bog's pitch black inner body. The surface and the bottom were invisible, and it felt like I was being suspended in a state of nothingness. Suddenly, the underwater ambience began to resemble itself. Gradually, the sounds of moving water became almost silent whispers. They gradually grew louder and louder, and I began to understand their messages. Let me in, they cried in chaotic intervals. Embrace me. Let me in. Let me in. Distraught, uncanny wails soon arose from the depths. At first, they seemed inhuman. But as they got louder, they appeared to resemble the desperate cries of an infant and an adult female meshed together. These sounds pierced my mind, and I could feel my thoughts begin to tear apart my mind beginning to split into a thousand pieces. I was oddly intrigued by this experience, rather than fearful. The subterranean landscape was showing me sights I had never seen before. Its disturbed, surreal mind inserting itself into my own. Images began to flood my head, millions passing through by the minute, cold, dead hands sticking out of the meadow sedges, a child's deceased body decaying at the bottom of the bog, 
a deer struggling to make its way out of a muddy demise. Those are some of the images I witnessed. The landscape was revealing its twisted worship of death and decay to me, a new knowledge that I accepted without question. We will become one, it whispered to me, one in death. A burning pain surged through my lungs, and I quickly made for the surface, emerging right next to the overturned canoe. The fog was now dense, and I could only see about five feet in front of me. To make matters worse, a flashlight had been swallowed by the bog, my only light being what little moonlight shone through the mist. I was still driven to keep moving through the bog, however, I needed to reach my unconscious destination. Abruptly, I heard thrashing in the water, which was followed by the sounds of heavy breathing and blood-curdling screams. They belonged to William, and I simply watched him struggle to grab onto the surrounding sedges, completely disregarding the canoe. Stop it! Stop it, please! He yelled. What do you want from me? What do you want from me? Will fearfully scurried onto the meadow of sedges, his body soaked and shaking, his head darting in all directions. He ran away into the fog, struggling to make it through the layers of mud. What's going on? I heard him scream from a distance. And then he was gone, leaving me with the bog's silence. My sympathy for William had been declining ever since we set off into the bog, its influence growing stronger and stronger in my mind. I was driven to let the landscape lead me further within itself. My friend was clearly resisting the drive's effect on his own thoughts. I swam over to the canoe and tipped it back up. A single oar was floating underneath the craft and I threw it in before struggling to get in myself. It took me a while, but I eventually got back and paddled onward through the foggy, narrow channel. Without any light, I had to use the sedges as a guide through the constant twists and turns. The bog was now much more than a natural landscape. Eventually, the channel opened up. The sedges started to disappear behind the ominous fog, and I was soon surrounded by open water on all sides. This gave off the illusion of an ocean, and my new surroundings were incomprehensible to me. The sensations going through my body were completely alien, and I started to panic somewhat. I didn't know which way was left, right, forward, or backwards. It felt like the bog was stealing my spatial awareness, giving it the creative freedom to alter itself. The only thing I could do now was paddle on and let the bog carry me through its mind. There was no going back. In the distance, I made out what looked to be a small, worn down wooden dock, jutting off a plain of sedges. The large pond seemed to end here. I attributed this to the bog's illusions at first, but on closer inspection, the landing was in fact real. I paddled up to it, noticing the decaying brown wood. A worn out metal spoke stuck out of the top, and a tattered strand of rope was tied to it. I tied the canoe to the dock and stepped onto the decrepit structure. It was surprisingly sturdy, although it made a horrific creaking noise that echoed throughout the wetland. I looked back towards the opaque, unending water, noticing how it remained calm, mirroring nothing but blackness. Suddenly, feelings of insecurity surged through my mind. I felt like I was being watched through the silence. Fearful, I made for the sedges, 
singing in the almost knee-deep mud. The terrain was difficult to navigate through, and a crescendo of paranoia grew inside me. My original mesmerization with the landscape was now turning to dread as I became stuck in the muddy meadow. Help! I yelled. Help! A harsh wind began to howl, and I could feel the sedges rub against my body. I darted my head around, trying to find some way out, but there was only fog. Something, however, caught my eye. To my left, the grass had been indented, making a gap in the meadow. There was something in the gap, and I stared at it for a moment. Strangely, my fear began to recede, and I made my way over to the indent, wrestling through the mud. The thing I had seen from a distance was now coming into view. What I saw initially shocked me. However, these feelings soon turned to a grotesque acceptance and even celebration. It was William, lying face up, the sedges gently caressing his dead, mutilated body. Massive cuts had been etched into his arms and chest, and his throat had been slit on both sides, creating a triangular shape. Blood was streaming out of his wide, open mouth, a look of absolute terror on his face. He would become one with the bog soon enough, in his death and decay. William would finally understand the logic that he denied in his fear, and his body would become part of the landscape's mesmerizing illusions. I turned around and looked out across the vast pond I had paddled through. The fog had lifted moderately, and I could see where I'd entered through the channel. The shape of the bog's mind was revealing itself to me, and my drive was more powerful than ever. My body began to shake and tremble, and the sound of ominous whispers started to seize my being once more. Come to me. Let me in. Come to me. Slowly, my head turned towards the left side of the pond. The whispers began to grow in volume, becoming more demanding by the minute. Let me in. Let me in. Let me in. The wind began blowing faster and faster, blustering the sedges completely sideways, and the black water now forming violent waves. Frantic, feminine cries echoed through what was left of the fog. The bog's mind was becoming more visible to me by the minute. Its disturbed psyche again penetrating itself into my own. Complete chaos began to ensue, the winds becoming heavy gusts, and the cries and voices becoming deafening. Yet, I stood next to William's body, immersing myself in these elements. In the midst of all of this, my eyes started to focus in the distant sedges. I could barely make out a familiar, black, shadow-like figure slowly rising from the grass. It stood there in the chaos, staring straight at me. In the darkness, I saw its arm rise, and its hand begin to beckon. All sensation, feeling, and thought in my body came to a turbulent halt as I watched the shadow call to me. The time had finally come. Everything was coming into place. I slowly stepped through the distraught, desperate screams of the bogs unconscious, moving towards the rippling water. My union with the bog's mind was imminent. I kept my eyes focused on the shadow, 
its being appearing and disappearing from my eyesight. I could feel the water embrace my ankles as I made my way into the muddy, sinister depths. I kept going deeper and deeper, letting the bug welcome my disassembled consciousness into the sentience of the landscape. I soon was up to my neck, and finally, my head went beneath the surface. The water began to drag me further under, its aquatic hands bringing my body down to the muddy, decaying bottom. My lungs were now on fire, and I knew that death was imminent. I felt my back hit the bottom, sinking into the layers of mud. My arms brushed against something, something eerily familiar. I observed my water surroundings seconds from death. The last thing I felt were the cold bodies against my own. The pod hit the surface of the ocean with a thump, sending a wall of white water high into the air and splattering the onlookers with a cold shower of droplets. Dr. Hunter could just about hear the muffled cheers and claps of the people on board the Katiana. He made his final checks to make sure everything was in order and that the airlocks were functioning and then began his descent. He took one last glance at the Katiana and his fellow colleagues on the deck before being swallowed by the ocean. He had waited a long time for this moment, hours of research and struggling to convince the committee for research funding. He had spent 18 months preparing everything needed for the voyage, from locating the best spot for the dive to putting together a crew for the boat. It wasn't a cheap project, but if all went to plan, he would become one of the first people to see the infamous giant squid in its natural habitat. Just then, a voice crackled through the intercom. Everything alright down there, Dr. Hunter? said the voice. Yes, everything seems to be working as planned, Captain. How are things on the surface? Oh yes, very good. Sun's shining and sea's not too choppy. We couldn't have picked a better day, the captain exclaimed. Captain Takahashi was a short man in his 60s. He had grown up in a seaside town in Japan and became a professor in marine biology later in life. He was a friendly man and had jumped at the chance to be a part of the project. He and his men worked long and hard to make this whole thing possible. Excellent news, replied Dr. Hunter. Could you put Tabitha on? Tabitha was a PhD student who had worked with Dr. Hunter on his project from the start. She was an excellent student, always enthusiastic and always smiling. How's everything going down there, sir? Came a voice from the intercom a few moments later. Oh, everything seems to be going to plan. I just wanted to thank you again for all your help. I couldn't have done it without you, Dr. Hunter said. That's great, sir. I hope it's not too scary for you down there, she laughed. See you in a few hours. If you're lucky, there might be some beers left. Good luck. The pod had descended so far that it started to get dark at this point and the doctor glanced at the depth meter to his right. The dial read the depth as just past 1300 meters. The descent continued, and it wasn't long before the only light came from the small flashlights and a small screen displaying the infrared camera views from the front and rear of the pod. All they were displaying at the moment were small specks of debris that will whiz past as the pod dropped ever deeper. 
A while later, the dial showed the depth hit 2,000 meters and gave a small beep that pierced the silence. Dr. Hunter took his eyes off the camera screen and clicked a switch on the control panel. This opened a small valve on a capsule attached to the rear of the pod, and the contents began to billow out as a creamy cloud. It was made up of blended squid that the giant squid is known to feed on. The hope was that any giant squid in the area would smell this mix and come to investigate. The pod eventually came to a halt at 2,800 meters deep. It was almost pitch black and eerily quiet now. The doctor sat alone in his pod. The only thing connecting him to the rest of the world above the surface being the radio to Katiana. Three hours had passed and Dr. Hunter blinked at his watch in shock. It hadn't felt like three hours. His heart had been beating with excitement and anticipation and the time had flown by. His eyes felt dry from staring at the screen in front of him, waiting for something to appear. He gave a disheartened sigh. He only had two hours before the oxygen reserves would start running low and he would have to make his ascent back up into the light. He was beginning to lose hope of seeing a giant squid in the wild. All this work, all this preparation, for nothing. He dreaded rising to the surface and seeing the disappointed faces of the people aboard the Katiana. He rubbed his eyes. No, he said aloud into the empty space, shaking his head as he did so. He was not about to give up. He had waited so long for this. He wouldn't get another chance. He focused his gaze back on the screen, praying that something would appear. Just then, the speaker for the radio began to crackle. He looked around at it, listening closely as the try make out a voice. Hello? He said into the radio microphone. Captain Takahashi, can you hear me? There was no reply. The radio just continued to crackle. Perhaps it could not receive signal this deep down. It should be able to. It cost enough, he thought to himself. The crackling began to get louder and louder until it was almost unbearable. Then, just as suddenly as it started, it went silent. He hoped everything was okay on the surface. It was a big risk for him to be down here, and even the smallest fault could mean catastrophe. Dr. Hunter turned back to the screen, feeling slightly unsettled. As he did so, he could have sworn he saw a shape move suddenly out of view. He leaned closer, his heart pounding with excitement, scanning the darkness for anything of interest. Could this be it? The unsettled feeling in his stomach was gone, the crackling from the radio forgotten about. As he looked, he could have sworn he could see things appearing and sinking back into the gloomy depths. He rubbed his eyes again and took a sip from his water bottle, trying not to take his eyes off of the screen. Was he seeing things, he wondered? Then he saw it in the top right hand corner of the screen, a shape in the darkness. It seemed to be coming straight towards the pod, but it didn't look like a giant squid. It looked like... No, it couldn't be, he told himself. His mind was playing tricks on him, surely. He looked out the porthole to see if he could make out anything through the darkness. It was pitch black. He looked back at the screen. The figure was gone. The unsettled feeling was back. He felt sick to his stomach, and sweat drenched him. He didn't care about the squid anymore. 
He just wanted to be out of this cramped little box and back on dry land in the sunshine, sharing a beer with Tabitha. He turned to the control panel, ready to set the pod for the ascent. He stopped himself. Was he overreacting? Surely he was just imagining things. He couldn't give up now, he thought. That was when he heard it. A gentle scraping on the side of the pod. Dr. Hunter froze, sweating profusely now, staring at the spot where the noise was coming from. Then another noise, even more terrifying than the first. This time, it came from the other side of the pod. Three short, clear knocks. Shaking, he keyed the code for the ascent into the control panel. Nothing happened. He tried again. Still, nothing. The lights behind the keyboard flickered and then went out, dousing the pod in complete, impenetrable darkness. Panicking, the doctor fumbled for a flashlight behind the seat. Switching it on, he shone it at the rear porthole. He scanned the water for any movement. It was completely silent once again. He felt trapped and alone, like he was lost deep in space. He turned around to shine the torch out of the front porthole. He cried out in terror. There, pressed against the glass, was a pale, greyish, wrinkled hand with long, skeletal fingers. Without even having to think about it, Dr. Hunter pulled the backup power lever, praying it would work. It did. The hand was gone from the portal now. The doctor wasted no time keying in the code for the ascent. To his relief, it worked. A whirring sound came from the engine of the pod as it began to rise back up to the surface. He was sick onto his lap and the floor in front of him. Tears were streaming out of his eyes. He almost couldn't bring himself to look at the screen in fear of what he might see. When he finally did, there was nothing to be seen. Dr. Hunter wondered to himself, had he imagined it all? Could it have possibly been brought on by the silence and isolation and the never-ending darkness? He grabbed the radio mic. Hello, Captain, are you there? Can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? There was no response. He tried again. There was still nothing. After some time, it began to get light. The pod was getting closer to the surface. He had been trying the radio non-stop, but there was still no response. He still felt sick, and his hands were still clammy with sweat. The smell of his vomit filled his nose, making him feel even more nauseous. His mind was racing. Was it real? What was it? Was he safe? He knew one thing for sure. If he got out of this, he was never returning to the sea again. He didn't care if people thought he was crazy. Just then, the pod burst through the surface of the water. The sun was now hidden by storm clouds, but it had not begun raining and the sea was still calm. He looked through the front porthole and there it was. The Katiana, bobbing gently on the waves. The white hole almost glowing. It was a welcoming sight, and for the first time since beginning the ascent, Dr. Hunter felt safe. But then, as he looked closer, he could see something wasn't right. Where was the crew? They should be eagerly waiting aboard for his return. 
he could just make out something crimson red running down the side of the pearly white hull. That was when he heard it again. Knock, knock, knock. Once, two slits ran around the circumference of my abdomen. I stood alone in the bathroom behind locked doors as I carefully examined the slits. The higher of the two slices circled my body just above my belly button, low enough to avoid passing over the bottom of my ribcage. Beneath that one, the bottom slit sat about two or three inches lower, just above the highest crest on either side of my pelvis. In the mirror before me, I could turn to see that the slits ran uninhibited over my backside as well. Two perfect straight lines wrapping all the way around me. With mild curiosity, I pressed my finger to the center of the bottom slit, forcing them into the narrow opening in my navel. As they pressed into the aperture, I could feel the internal warmth of my body and the unhindered, rhythmic movements of my inner processes. Over the pads of my fingers, my blood calmly ran and the muscles moved without problem. I removed the hand from the slit, finding a red fluid adorning my digits, but not flowing from the opening itself. The blood remained suspended within me, not allowing passage outside through either of the slices around my belly. Rather firmly, I pressed on my belly button on the region between the two slits. As I applied steady pressure, I could feel the whole mass moving, sliding slowly out of my body. In the mirror, I could see that the stout cylinder of flesh that had dwelled between the slits, gradually moved off center as I pushed upon it. Soon, it flung halfway out of my body, drooping down under the weight of gravity and looked like one of Dali's melting clocks. Despite the detachment from the rest of me, practically no blood escaped and everything in my body calmly kept to its business. Looking down, I grasped the flat disc of flesh with my fingers, digging my hands into the soft red matter and pulled the disc all the way out of my body. It escaped its place with a wet popping sound and I beheld it before me. Holding the narrow cylinder of flesh taken from my abdomen with both hands, I carefully examined the cross section of my gut. On the back side of the disc, I could see a rigid white structure, which I took to be the vertebrae of my lower back. In the front of the bone, a large squirming nest of my intestines nestled together for warmth. I could move the organic tubes with a soft flick of my fingers, and with them, I could feel the contents of my breakfast, mostly digested now. Two dark structures sat in parallel on either side of the disc, and after a thoughtful pause, I recognized them to be the bottom of my kidneys. A few inches from the kidneys, another oddly colored organ dwelled in the center of the whole thing. Unfortunately, I couldn't recognize it. Perhaps I were a doctor, I could inform you in more detail of the living disc I held. But at the time, I mostly just marveled at the odd, semi-rubbery texture of the utterly natural object and the way it seemed to pulsate with life, even though an island from my body. I quietly set the disc down on the bathroom sink to observe the perfect cavity it had left in my abdomen. In its place, I found nothing but air. My body remained upright and functional, despite my upper half being entirely disconnected from my lower half 
by the space of one or two inches. Not yet feeling any side effects from the removal, I casually move the disc from the sink to the floor, dusting off a spot to set it where it might not collect dirt. For a moment, I watched the immobile thing. With a soft shock, I realised it must have been thirsty and went to fetch it some water from the sink. I turned the faucet on and held a gulp of water in a bowl of my hands, which I then fed to the disc by pouring it into the dull red tubing at the centre of the round object. The thing seemed to quietly inhale with pleasure at the offering, and the whole disc shivered happily. Chilled goosebumps ran over the ring of skin on its side. I sat down next to it and watched it grow. The spinal column made the first movements, sprouting up from its roots maddeningly slowly as it reached up toward the fluorescent lights above. Thin strings of nerves and fat ran from the bone tendril to the rest of the flesh waiting below, and with the prodding, the rest of the flesh swelled and reached up to follow the spinal column on its journey upwards. The detached base of the kidneys quickly grew, stretching up into full organs of their distinct shapes. Soon the rest of the flesh and intestines caught up, wrapping around the organs. I gave the maturing thing more water, and its growth swelled again, soon blossoming a rib cage complete with a barely functioning heart and a set of lungs which hung between the gleaming fresh bones. In all this time, the skin hardly made any progress at all, leaving the growing being's flesh exposed to the drafty air of the restroom. Two thin arms extended from the warm column, stretching down to the floor, where its barren fingers gently touched the bathroom tiles. Above the ribcage, a knobbly neck timidly extended, and upon that, a jagged skull grew. Flesh danced upon the growing skeleton until it decorated the majority of the left side of its face. A pale tongue slithered out from the jaw, just as a wet eye swam up into the socket. No iris adorned the eye, just a solid black pupil. Greetings. The life form greeted me in a weak voice. As it spoke, its entire esophagus shook in place, giving its timber a harsh, barking grind to it. A constant cough, it forcefully formed into a misshapen voice. Hello, I nodded respectfully, trying to gauge the being's expression, but the lack of material on its skull fail to show any understandable human emotions. You ought to shut the tap off, the thing growled quietly, although seemingly without aggression. It's rather wasteful of you. I realised the tap was still running, pouring water down the sink. How do you feel? I asked it, ignoring its request. Almost. How's it going? I rephrased my question. Almost. I frowned at the conversation, a bit disappointed. The thing struggled to breathe for a moment, looking as if it might fall apart, but it managed to pull itself back together. Why am I alive? It asked in its creaking tone. I don't know, I replied with a shrug. Why does it hurt? It asked, undeterred. I don't know. When does it end? It tried again, unsatisfied with my answer. I don't know. We didn't talk for a while then both sitting quietly on the bathroom floor. The only sound came from the sink, with the tap still running idly. You need your guts back, don't you? The almost life said at last, 
sounding defeated. I guess you can keep it a while longer if you like, I answered politely. No, it was never mine to begin with, it shook its head. And you ought to shut the tap off, it's rather wasteful of you. I nodded. With that, it dug its fingers into the base of the spinal cord, and with a tug, uprooted itself from the disc of my flesh. It fell down over the tiled flooring, its skull clicking sharply against the hard ground as its newly formed tendons relaxed into inanimation. After turning off the tap, I collected the disc from the ground, wiped it off, and quietly pressed it back into place. It slid perfectly into the space on my midriff, resting just where it was before. The severed flesh tied back into a solid sheet, and the intestines sewed themselves together into one functioning machine. At last, the skin on the outside embraced again, removing all signs of the two original slits. In the end, I was as whole as I began. On the centre of the bathroom floor, the upper half of the deceased lay in a pool of its borrowed blood, lost from its own stream. Its pupil stared off from its almost dead eye, perpetually fixed on the locked door of the small room. In the end, I was not as whole as I began. On the southern edge of the small town of Ranville, there is a wide, unlit road that separates the town from a wild and thick forest. Three houses adorn the northern edge of the road. They are the homes of the Peters family, old Mrs. Abernathy, and Joshua Daniels, respectively, and they look out across the road upon the forest that the sun can scarcely pierce. Many travellers who have taken the road late in the evening have confessed to feeling a peculiar sense of uneasiness as they pass the trees in the darkness. There are stories shared in hushed whispers amongst the children of the town that speak of an evil presence lurking within the woods. Apart from the occasional incident of missing cattle, no apparition of maliciousness has ever befell Ranville and so the town slumbers peacefully beside the gargantuan labyrinth of ancient oaks. It was in the early days of autumn that the men came and installed lights up and down the road that cast their luminous light into the trees. It was a welcome change to the residents of the road, who hoped that this would ease any feelings of insecurity in the darkness. Any wrongdoers who had previously made mischievous plans for the road would surely be exposed and foiled, and so the residents hoped for a good night's rest. While the additional light took a little getting used to, they all slept easy that night, except for Adam Peters, the son of the Peters family, who had horribly unpleasant dreams, but that is often the case for children when confronted with any sort of change. The next morning, the residents all agreed that the lights were a blessing sent from above. On the third night after the arrival of the lights, Mrs. Abernathy sat in a chair by the window, reading from a book. She was always of restless spirit, so it was not an uncommon occurrence for her to stay up until the first rays of sun peeked up from the horizon. On this particular evening, the clock had just passed one, and her mind had begun to drift from her literature. She looked out of a window upon the illuminated street. Everything seemed much clearer to her, and she took some small pleasure in watching the trees creak ever so slightly in the wind. The leaves engaged in subtle, ritualistic dances, and the branches swayed unsteadily. Then, something caught her eye. Some bushes 
that didn't match the natural rhythm the others seemed to share. It could have easily been some nocturnal animal of the wild attending to his business, and yet Mrs. Abernathy felt uneasy. Perhaps it was the result of her imagination, captivated by late night reading, but she could swear she felt that the more she watched the disturbance, the more she felt that she was being watched herself. Slightly disturbed by the ordeal, she drew the blinds and returned to a book in an effort to take a mind elsewhere. By the time morning came, she had forgotten all about her late night observations. As the sun was beginning to set the following evening, Adam Peters was playing alone on the road. The lights had not yet come on, and so he found himself in the ill-illuminated haze of dusk. The wind was of mild temperament, but still possessed a bitter, icy bite. It was not the ideal situation as he would have much preferred to find entertainment indoors, but his mother's insistence had driven him out into the cold autumn air. He was eagerly anticipating the moment that the lights would spring to life and his mother would fetch him to return indoors. The hours of play had been almost entirely devoid of fun and were replaced by a mysterious sense of uncertainty. He was without an inkling of doubt that something was not as it should be. And yet, he could not fathom what it could be. His dreams of late had been terrible in nature, and he suspected that this was influencing his mood. As he sat in reflection, he began to feel the hairs on his neck stand up. Adam felt the all too familiar sensation of someone standing directly behind him. He immediately turned himself around to discover there was nobody there. This was perplexing to Adam as he was certain he could sense the presence of another person. He scanned the neighboring houses and there was no visible signs of any other residents going about their business outdoors. Just as he was beginning to doubt himself, he heard the voice of his mother calling for him. He was relieved that he would be able to return to the comfort of his home and stood up at once. He ran up the front steps, crossed the porch and entered the house. As he was closing the door, he made one more attempt to identify the mysterious presence that was once again unsuccessful. The road was completely deserted. Later that night, Joshua Daniels awoke from a peaceful slumber by the unpleasant sensation of dryness of the throat. His thirstiness evicted him from his bed and carried him downstairs to the kitchen where he fetched a glass tumbler and filled it with water directly from the tap. The clock in his kitchen told him that it was nearing three, which irritated him immensely as he knew his remaining hours of precious sleep would be insufficient for the day ahead. Just as he was switching off the kitchen light, he heard a faint yet distinguishable tapping noise coming from the road outside. He was intrigued and unsettled by the noise coming at such a late hour. In his freshly awakened state, it took him a little more time before he came to a realization about the nature of the noise. He was hearing the sound of footsteps crossing the road as they got increasingly closer to the side of his home. A looming sense of dread grasped him and held him in place as it was an almost unheard of occurrence for someone to be walking the road this hour. The footsteps stopped and Joshua remained petrified in his kitchen for several minutes until he was able to muster the courage to approach the window. It took a great deal of bravery to pull back the blind and peer out into the newly lightened road. However, his bravery offered him little in the way of answers. There was not a single person that Joshua could see anywhere in the gardens, or the road, or the forest. He hastily made his way to his door to ensure that it was locked. 
He then made his way upstairs to spend the hours until the sun rose with the light on, convincing himself that he had been imagining the whole event. It was the unfamiliar coldness of her house that awoke Anne Peters the next morning. Immediately, she sprung from her bed to investigate why her house felt so alien to her. She walked down the stairs and was at once struck by the alarming sight of the front door wide open to the elements. The feeling of her security being so harshly violated was enough to bring her to tears. Making her way over to the door, she began to notice strange marks on the floor. They were violent indents into the wood, as if someone had attempted to maintain a grip to the floor while resisting some pulling force. In an instant of pure fear, Anna knew exactly what had happened. She let out a deafening scream that woke most of the town. Her husband appeared to her aid within moments, and through uncontrollable bursts of tears, she pleaded him to check on Adam's room. When he entered his son's room, he confirmed the darkest fears of his wife. Their son was nowhere to be seen. He sprinted out into the middle of the road, desperately calling his son's name, but to no avail. Perhaps if he had not been so distressed, he would not have overlooked a torn piece of his son's shirt that hung nonchalantly on the edge of a bush at the mouth of the forest. The rest of that day was a tempest of confusion, anger and fear for the residents of the road. Many of the men of the town were called upon to search for the young boy, but hours upon hours of searching offered no clues to his fate or whereabouts. Joshua didn't speak of the events that had befallen him the night before, due to some combination of fear, denial and guilt. But it did motivate him to take some sort of action. He emerged from his home with his tool set and set about deactivating each and every light that had made them feel so safe. Joshua knew now, as did the other residents, that sometimes... It is better for the darker places of the world to remain unilluminated. I'm going to tell you about a town, a town you should never go to. For your protection, I won't tell you the name or location, but I'll tell you this. If you ever think you might be in this town, get the hell out of there and don't look back. It happened some years ago. I was on my way to visit an uncle I'd never met, meandering around, trying to read a rather confusing map when I ran out of gas. Stupid I know but I can never make heads or tails of those damn things. The dangers of hitchhiking were disconcerting, though there wasn't much choice, so I didn't bother fussing about it and started up the road. The midday sun was oppressive. My forehead ached from all the squinting, and my clothes were soaking up a gallon of sweat. My tired arm hung lower and lower, as did my hope of hitchhiking a ride but in the distance came into view a red pickup truck. Please stop! Please stop! I repeated, sticking my thumb out as far as it would go. As the truck grew closer, I waved my arms around until it eventually slowed down and stopped in the road. That your car back there? Asked the friendly old coot from behind the wheel. Yes, sir. I ran out of gas. Hop in. We'll get you some of the next stop. Cappy. What a nice guy he was. He sure liked to talk about his family. But they were entertaining stories. His son was fighting overseas, and I could tell his kindness was inspired by the admiration he felt for my generation. Heroes, he called us. 
You wouldn't catch me on the front lines, though. Always been one to shy away from danger. I didn't tell Cappy that. Didn't want to disappoint him. After some time, I started to wonder when this town would show up, and I expressed my concern that it might be too far away. It didn't seem to bother Cappy. I guess he had nothing better to do. Still never found out where he was headed. The road was getting bumpy, then turned into two brown strips with grass down the middle. I could finally see a town peeking over the wild fields. Pitiful, yet quaint. It was textbook small-town America. Faded blue houses with white trim, a few brick-and-mortar businesses with hand-painted signs, town square, big red barn, white chapel on a hill. Cars were parked here and there, some without tyres, though I didn't see any people around it. It wasn't surprising for such a remote hamlet. But what did surprise me was that, despite the barn, I didn't see any animals. There was no official fueling station, but we found an old garage with a gas pump out front. Cappy kept apologising for lending his gas can to a neighbour while we searched through the cluttered garage. A rancid odour would come and go, making me sicker each time. I'd better go find someone, I said, and tell them what we're doing so they don't think we're robbing the place. Really, I just wanted to get away from that smell. Look for a gas can in case I can't find one. Roger that. The town seemed deserted, but I could hear voices echoing from somewhere, so I followed them. Two children appeared from the tall grass, chasing each other down the road. In the distance was an apple orchard, with kids running to and fro, tossing apples at each other, some of them on all fours. As they approached, laughter and playful screams came from all sides. It seemed like a normal child behaviour, but then I noticed they were all wearing dog masks. There were a few children sitting at a pint-sized picnic table, playing with something that looked like cake, smushing it in their hands and smearing it on their clothes. I assumed from the cake, the masks, and the occasional party favours that there was a birthday party going on. Trying to seem as non-threatening as possible, I strolled over and attempted to question them. I'm sure someone baked that cake to be eaten, not played with, I said, trying to sound like an authoritative parent. The children stopped what they were doing and looked up at me. I got the shivers. The way they all turned their heads at the exact same moment, all wearing those dog masks. And these weren't cute cartoon dog masks. The attempt at realism lent them a disturbing quality. I'm sorry, but could you nice children take off those masks for a minute? The kids looked at each other, then back at me. I started to feel embarrassed. So, whose birthday is it? One of the children made a little yipping noise. Oh, it's you. Another child mimicked the other. Then, it's you? Hmm, is it your birthday? A third child joined in. Maybe it's all your birthdays. They didn't seem to be listening and continued to imitate puppies. Finally, I got a little testy. All that walking in the heat had already worn me down, and now these kids were poking at a beehive. You listen here. What would your parents say if they saw you being so rude? Why don't you take off those masks and act like children, not dogs? The kids started to yip louder, then transitioned to wolves, followed by short barks. Stop that! Where are your parents? I have car trouble and I need an adult right away. The children didn't heed my requests and instead threw cake in my face. It tasted horrible. In hindsight, I don't think it was cake. Fine then, 
But when I find your parents, they're going to hear all about this. It was like they didn't even know what I was saying. I turned to leave, but all the children that had been there, frolicking, were now standing side by side, blocking my way. Instead of telling them to move, I simply walked to the left in an attempt to go around them. But as I went one way, so did they. And as I went the other way, so did they. Cut it out. I didn't want to push them. They were just kids. I'll give you brats to the count of three to move, or else I'm going to walk right through you. The children stood there and said nothing. There must have been more than a dozen, gaping at them in all those masks. It was so surreal. No two masks were alike. Each one was a different breed of dog, with expressions ranging from docile to enraged. As I started counting, three, a few of the children began making faint, low grumbling noises. I continued to count down, two, and more children joined in with the nasty growls. I gave a heavy sigh, knowing they weren't going to move. All right then, one. All at once, the children began barking loudly. I was startled by how ferocious and angry they sounded. Stop that, I commanded, but they only barked louder. One of them chucked a rotten apple at me. It hurt. The other kids followed suit, and soon I fell victim to the spoiled fruit version of an old-fashioned stoning. I started to yell, wait till I find your parents, but took an apple to the face before I could finish. A few kids pushed me while I was distracted, and I lost my balance. They all rushed me, kicking and scratching. That does it. I was done fooling around. What the hell is wrong with you kids? I yelled shoving them one by one to the ground. But they remained unfazed, continuing to kick and scratch and make those irritating noises. The cacophonous howl and fierce barks made my blood boil. I started striking the children, not caring about their safety or what their parents would do in retaliation. After realizing what I had done, I ran off to find Cappy. The children chased me into town. They were just kids, but I was spooked as all hell. The masks, the noises, they didn't even stop when I hit them. I caught sight of Cappy's truck, but I didn't see him. The children were gaining on me as I tripped and fell. Again, I was surrounded by those violent brats. I tried to get up, but there were too many kids on me and my cries for help brought no assistance. Take off those goddamn masks, I hollered, attempting to pull one off. It was tied on tight. The barking turned to laughing, and I feared there might be other adults watching, mocking me instead of shooing away their insane offspring. My anger was just reaching its threshold, and the children suddenly stopped attacking. They all turned their heads in the same direction and ran off together, howling and cheering joyfully. I stumbled to my feet, inspecting myself for scrapes and bruises. Cappy? I shouted, looking all around. My voice echoed for miles. The children were out of sight, so I ran back towards the truck hoping to find him still searching the garage. I stopped at the general store first to see if anyone could help us, but no one was inside. They didn't seem to be in business. Shelves were mostly empty and caked with dust. I checked in the back. Nobody there. Then I heard some kind of uproar coming from outside. I peered out the window, but didn't see anyone. So, I opened the door a little 
and turned my ear. I was sure something was going on with those kids. The only noise in the whole town was coming from that one direction. Part of me knew I should go back to the garage, but I wanted to see if the children were being scolded for their behaviour. I followed the echoes until I clearly heard a guttural, anguished scream. The screaming continued as I banged on the nearest front door. Hey, is anybody home? Please. I jiggled the knob aggressively. Locked. There was another house about 30 yards away, so I banged on their door as well. Still, no one home. Or they just weren't answering. I circled the house, pounding on the windows, but it was no use. I had to make a decision. What would a hero do? I asked myself, and hurried towards uncertainty. The commotion was coming from a far house at the bottom of a hill near the orchard. I ran so fast I nearly fell head over heels, though I hesitated when I got to the house. The door was wide open and there were dog masks on the ground. I needed to know what was happening, but I wasn't prepared to find out. I thought about yelling for help again, or for Cappy, but I couldn't make a sound. When the screaming died down a little, I crept up the porch steps and peeked in, but didn't see anyone inside. Masks littered the floor. God help me, I couldn't just leave. Where would I have gone without a vehicle? It's not like I could have hotwired Cappy's truck. I had to go in. My footsteps made the boards creak, but I knew they wouldn't drown out the ruckus. A trail of masks led me closer to the disgusting sounds and through the dilapidated house to an open door leading down into the basement. A stench beyond foul almost knocked me over. Listening closely, I tried to identify what was happening. It was those kids for sure, growling, barking, whimpering, slobbering. Now and then, a gurgly, desperate moan of agony would come through. I didn't want to go down there, but I had to see it with my own eyes. Crouching a bit, I crept from one wet, sticky step to another. A single light bulb illuminated most of the room but didn't quite reach the stairs, so I knew I'd be hidden in the darkness. The floor was covered in muck that sloshed around as a few of the children scampered through it, tossing handfuls of it at each other. Most were gathered in the centre underneath the light. It seemed like they were eating something, or feeding rather. I watched in disgust as the children tore at the meat, blood dripping down their chins and squirting on their faces. And oh god, their faces. How can you have an underbite and an overbite at the same time? The turn up noses and far apart eyes. It was hideous. Beyond that, they all had various facial deformities of which I'm not equipped to describe. The laughter was almost more horrifying than anything because it meant they were having fun. I say this because I knew what they were eating. I just knew. I couldn't see what was left of his face, and his clothes were ripped to shreds. But I knew. I knew they were eating Cappy. I covered my mouth and tried not to scream or retch. Gagged a few times, but I didn't draw attention. My body tensed up so bad, I could hardly move. But I willed it to inch backwards up the stairs, through the kitchen and the front door. I prayed to God those kids wouldn't follow. I assumed I was free once I reached the door. 
but the most gruesome fellow was standing there at the bottom of the porch steps. He wore a ghastly beard and a toothless, smug grin. His frame was massive, and I could smell him from nine yards away. At first, we just glared at each other. I swear he had a wooden eye. I expected him to lunge at me. Instead, he pulled a small whistle from the front of his overalls. He pressed it to his lips and seemed to blow into it, but there was no sound. Sobbing and stumbling, I ran from house to house, banging on every door. The joyful roars of the children were drawing closer, so I took refuge in the store. They raced all around like it was a game of hide and seek while I barricaded myself in the back room, waiting for those monsters to give up the search. The front door rattled a few times, and I suddenly realized I was a sitting duck in there if that big guy broke in. I still don't know why he never came after me. Eventually, the voices and footsteps faded away, and the town fell silent once more. Night came, and the children could be heard howling in the distance. I wondered if they knew where I was, and was simply waiting until I came out to terrorize me. I thought of poor Cappy, and how delighted he was to help a total stranger. He didn't deserve to die in such a grisly manner. I wanted to find that gas can now more than ever. Not so I could escape, but so I could burn that house down. Hell, I wanted to burn the whole damn town. The howling passed, so I snuck out the back door and crawled on my belly to the woods, planning to wait for sunup, then hiking to our main road. There were no lights on in the town as I spied from the trees. I was worried the children might go wandering at night, and I'd never find my way back in the dark. A single silhouette could just barely be seen coming closer, and I could hear the rustling of the weeds. It was one of those savages. I hesitated to run, fearing they'd hear me and alert the others. There were a few rocks of substantial weight near my feet, so I picked one up and held it tight. I listened as the child snatched up an animal that leapt from the brush. As they gnawed at the poor creature, I moved in. They snarled and growled as they ate, masking the crinkles of dead leaves beneath my feet. I held my breath, stepping into arm's length while slowly lifting the rock over my head. Over and over, I bashed that child's head beyond recognition. I never thought I could do that to a child, especially with such abandon. But I didn't do it so much for my own safety, as I did it for Cappy. The sun began to rise, and I observed the boy's body. When I saw him lying all limp on the ground, head caved in and bloody. I regretted what I'd done. Sure, I wasn't a damned cannibal, but I felt like I'd stooped to their level. I murdered a child, and I can never take that back. Bits of laughter echoed from the town. Startled, I ran off in the wrong direction. Tired and hungry, I trudged through the fields and over hillsides until the sun was directly overhead. Now and then, I'd hear the faint sound of an engine, though I couldn't find a road. The weight of everything that had happened made it difficult to go on, but that weight lifted a bit when a ranch came into view on the horizon. As I approached, the unwelcome sound of children playing echoed across the meadow. A few were galloping here and there, making strange noises. It seemed like normal child behavior. But then I noticed they were all wearing horse masks.
I witnessed something in the emergency room that has haunted me every day. I have not shared this with anyone until now. I woke up with a pounding headache and a dry mouth. Not an uncommon morning condition for my college days. I looked around the unfamiliar bedroom until I found my phone. It was 11am on Sunday. I sat on the edge of the bed and began to put my clothes on. I noticed I was not alone. My heart started to race as I attempted to recall the previous night's drunken events. To my relief, I recognized the girl next to me as one of my friends as she rolled over in discomfort from the sunlight. I grabbed my shoes and started to put it on. Something was wrong. White heart pain shot up my leg as the inside of my shoe made contact with my big toe. I winced as I forced the Nike sneaker over my swollen foot. I threw my jacket on and made my way to the door. I immediately fell to the floor as soon as I put pressure on my right foot. I heard a burst of laughter from the girl behind me. Still a little drunk, eh? I replied. No, my foot is killing me. I think something is wrong. What did you do to it? You were fine last night when you were running around downtown, she asked. I recalled the memory of the previous day. Oh, damn, I was running? I got my big toenail removed because of that soccer injury from the intramural game. The doctor told me to take it easy. I must have not thought about it after I was drinking. My foot was still numb from the anesthetic. Ouch. Well, go home and take care of it, she said. I sighed and said goodbye and left. Being a dumb college kid, I limped the entire two miles back to the shack my college roommates and I called home. I immediately sat down and started drinking to curb the hangover. It wasn't until later that night someone decided to talk some sense into me. We had some friends over and one girl, who happened to be a pre-med, noticed my limping. What happened to you? She asked. Uh, I had a minor surgery in my foot and it just hurts. I could barely put my shoe on this morning. I replied. She got a closer look at my leg. Oh my god, you need to go to the hospital. You see those red streaks running up your leg? That's blood poisoning. She grabbed my arm and rushed me to a car. She was nice enough to drop me off at the front door of the ER. Half drunk, I limped inside and was immediately wheeled back to a room. This began the strangest night of my life. The ER of the university hospital was especially crowded. I was put into a room that was already occupied, with a plastic curtain separating me from the other patients. The occupants of the room caught my attention. There was an unconscious man on the other bed, stiff as a board and drained of all color. Next to his bed was a woman, extremely thin, with a sunken face and tattered grey hair, and looked like she hadn't slept in years. She sat frozen in her chair. Sitting in front of the couple was a tall male nurse, an EMT, and a police officer. The woman gazed forward with a blank stare as the cop spoke to her. Ma'am? You need to tell us what your boyfriend took. He's going to die, but we may be able to save him if you just tell us. We want to hear it in English. Can you do that? The woman didn't respond. The interrogation went on like that for a while, and the woman continued to stare forward with her unwavering gaze. Finally, my nurse came back in to hook up an IV to me. She spoke. This should help with the infection, and will help sew you up a bit. I looked at her, and she winked at me. She leaned in and whispered to me. Sorry about the patients next to us. Try and ignore them if you can. She returned to a normal volume. The hospital is pretty crazy tonight, so the resident doctor wants me to work on getting this infection out of your foot. You're lucky this didn't reach your lymph nodes. Sepsis is no joke. I'm going to have to make an incision on your toe and drain out the infection. I'll numb you with a local anaesthetic first. 
I grimaced as she stuck the long needle into my toe. I'll be back in 15 minutes when you're numb, the nurse said as she left. I looked out to the hall as she walked out. I noticed another police officer just outside, and he was talking with a priest. It was not uncommon to see priests around campus. The university was Catholic. But I found it strange that he was right outside my hospital room. The man in the bed next to me had not moved. Maybe he was going to die and they were going to read him his last rites. My heart was racing. I had never witnessed the death before. I turned my gaze from the hall to the curtain next to me. Just behind it was the strange woman, but she was now staring directly at me with her dull, grey eyes. I quickly turned away from her. I felt eyes pierce through me as an icy shiver crept down my spine. My nurse returned and started setting up a prep table. She sterilized the scalpel and my toe and began cutting. I couldn't look. I'm not very good with that sort of thing. Without thinking, I turned my head to the right again. The woman was still staring at me. As soon as her eyes met, I had the strangest vision. It was like I started daydreaming, but it was so vivid. I imagined myself taking the scalpel and stabbing my nurse with it over and over again. I heard the sounds of her screams and saw the horrific bloody mess. I yelled aloud, No! I snapped out of the daydream. I was horrified with what I had just imagined. I was not a violent person at all. I had never even thought about anything that graphic in my life. My stomach began to turn with nausea. Concerned with my outburst, the nurse asked me if I was okay. I told her I was, and she continued. I looked to my right again at the withered woman. She was still staring at me, but now was smiling an eerily wide smile. It was like she was amused at my discomfort. I turned away and decided not to look back. The nurse finished, wrapped my foot, and told me she would be back later to check on me. As she left, more medical personnel entered and wheeled away the man who was on the bed. They had draped a sheet over his body. The police officer and priest walked in and closed the door. The priest gave me a slight nod as he walked by. I noticed my cross necklace was exposed through my hospital gown. The two men walked behind the curtain. I jumped in fright as soon as I heard it. The woman started hissing and screaming as soon as she saw the priest. The police officer spoke. Cut that out or I will arrest you. The priest interjected. No need for that at the moment. Miss Bayer, my name is Father DeMarco. I heard the woman spit. He spoke again, but this time it was in a different language. I hadn't been to church in a while, but some of the Latin caught my ear. I heard nomine, which I know means name. To my amazement, she responded. The words hissed out of her mouth at an incredible rate. She spoke in Latin, just as the priest had. When she stopped, the cop spoke. This is how she was talking when we found her father. What is she saying? The priest replied. I need you to leave us. Take the boy. The cop then walked over to me. Let's get you to another room, son. This woman has been through a lot tonight. I was happy to leave. I just wanted to be out of there. I got out of my bed and climbed into my wheelchair. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as the woman spoke aloud in English. Your mother misses you, David. She then let out the most terrifying laugh I have ever heard. As the cop wheeled me out of my room, I could hear her maniacal laughter trailing off behind me. 
My eyes welped up with tears as I reflected on two things. First, my mother took her own life a few years ago. Second, and even more disturbing, none of the medical staff in that room had said David aloud. It started as a joke. My wife and I host a lot of parties, and if you've ever done cleanup after a party, you know that people leave things behind. Hats and coats constantly, scarves, purses, whatever. One time, I found a pair of prescription glasses stuck between the couch cushions. They were thick lenses too, like Felma thick. I don't know how the owner made it out of the front door without them, let alone how they drove home. A lot of the time, we'll get a call the next day or next week, someone going, Hey, so I haven't seen my jacket lately, did I leave it at your place? But sometimes, no one ever claims it. And Jenny and I, Jenny's my wife, we weren't about to call everyone who was at the party to ask if they're missing whatever we've found. So, we just chuck it in a wooden chest we've got in the closet and leave it in there until someone does come looking. So recently, we had a winter party and someone left their pants here. Now, it was not that kind of party, so I was pretty surprised to find a pair of pants lying around afterward. They were snow pants, the kind you wear over your clothes to keep them warm and dry, and they were folded up and stored in the corner. I figured that someone probably had shown up in them to stay warm, then taken them off since they got inside. Between the warmth of the house and the warmth of the alcohol, they must have forgotten to put them back on when they left at the end of the night. Jenny flipped through her pictures from the evening, but didn't have any shots of anyone wearing those pants, so into the trunk they went. As Jenny was tossing them in, she commented, I bet we could clothe the whole person with what's in here. We laughed, but then I got to thinking that she was probably right. So later on, I dug through the trunk, and sure enough, in addition to the pants, we had a button-down shirt, multiple jackets, several hats, a pair of gloves, a couple of scarves, and two pairs of shoes. While Jenny was out of the house that night, I put the shirt on a hanger, hung the jacket over it, clipped the gloves to the sleeves and the pants to the bottom, and wrapped a scarf around it. Then I hung the whole thing up in the hallway, plopped a hat on top, and put some shoes beneath it. The pants hung just to the ground, so at first glance, it really did look like someone lurking there, especially with the lights off. I heard the door slam when Jenny got home. She started to call out a greeting, but it abruptly cut off in a shriek. I came into the hallway, laughing, to find Jenny standing there with a hand to her chest, glaring at me. The clothes dummy swung quietly off to the side. Real funny, she said. You about gave me a heart attack. I'm very sorry, I said, but I was laughing much too hard for her to believe me. Yeah, you will be, she said with mock seriousness. But she was laughing too, now that she was past the initial shock. Anyway, I thought that was all extremely funny, right up until I got up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet. I walked into the bedroom, turned on the lights, and shouted loud, because Jenny had moved my clothes dummy into the bathroom and posed it sitting on the toilet. From the bedroom, I heard sleepy laughter. Do you know what happens when you scare someone who's on his way to the bathroom? I demanded. Rags are under the sink. Clean up whatever you need to. Jenny called back. A lesser man would have to clean up. I have iron self-control, I told her. Is that why you screamed loudly enough to wake me up? She teased. I didn't dignify that with a response. Also, I didn't have one. 
So this became a thing. Janie and I would move the dummy around, and after a while, it wasn't even to scare each other anymore. We named him Albert, and he was just a feature of the house after a few weeks. We'd put him in the kitchen, the dining room, wherever. I came home a couple of days ago to find the clothes slumped to my chair in front of the TV, with one of my beers in his glove. I just got another beer and took a seat on the couch. Jenny came in later and said, You're not going to move him? He was here first, I shrugged. You're ridiculous, Jenny told me, and took Albert's beer. He's not going to like that, I said. Jenny laughed. What's he going to do about it? That was a couple of days ago, like I said. Yesterday, I came home to find Albert hanging by the picture window at the back of the house. His clothes were splashed with something red, and there was a dripping knife wedged in one of his gloves. It was a pretty gruesome sight, and I applauded Jenny's ingenuity. Did he get you, honey? I called. No response, obviously. She wasn't about to give up the joke that easily. Hey, the stuff is dripping on the floor. I said loudly enough for her to hear me wherever she was hiding. I think it's staining the carpet. Still, nothing. So, I got a paper towel and wiped up the quote-unquote blood. Then took Albert's knife away from him. Whatever Jenny had used really did look like blood. I was starting to get uncomfortable. Honey? Okay, you got me. Joke's over. Still, no response. So, I went looking. I went through the entire house and couldn't find her anywhere. Her car was out front, but Jenny was just missing. I called her phone, but it rang through to voicemail. When she still hadn't shown up by midnight, I was starting to get panicked. I'd called a few friends, but no one had heard from her. I decided to get a few hours of sleep, and then figure out what to do in the morning. I laid down, turned out the lights, and was falling asleep when I heard a slight noise in the hallway. I opened my eyes to see Jenny in the doorway. Where have you been? I started, turning on the lights, but my voice died in my throat. It wasn't Jenny. It was Albert, hanging from the doorway of my room, swaying slightly back and forth above his shoes. The knife was back in his hand. My heart was hammering. This was obviously just Jenny taking the joke too far. But when I called out for her again and she didn't answer, my fear spiked. I took those clothes down, carried them downstairs, and even though I knew it was totally illogical, I burned them in the fireplace. I expected Jenny to come out and laugh at me once I got the fire going, or at least to chide me for stinking up the house. I don't know what they packed snow pants with, but it smells terrible when you burn it. But the fire burned down to ashes, and I was still alone. I slept for a bit, and when I left for work this morning, there was still no sign of Jenny, and she still wasn't answering her phone. I called the police to report her missing and they're supposed to be sending someone over to take a look around and interview me, I guess. I hope they get here soon, because I just heard a noise from upstairs, and when I went to look, the door to our walk-in closet was standing open. Hanging from the bars, and lined in two neat rows, were a dozen of Jenny's outfits. Shirts still on the hangers, pants clipped below, Shoes lined up underneath. The bedroom door only locks from the inside, but I closed it and used my tie to tie the knob to the banister in the hallway. I was going to leave the house, but there's a coat rack by the door, and I really don't think I lined up my shoes underneath it like that when I got home. I hope the police get here soon.
I am recording this in hopes that someone can tell me they have experienced something similar. I don't know why I care about that. No matter what anyone says, the situation will be the same. And I will still think that I am losing my mind. Anyway, I hope everyone will take what I'm saying seriously. I know how it sounds. If I were listening to this on some random video on YouTube, I would be skeptical as well. But take everything I say seriously. For everything I'm about to say is 100% true. I used to go to college at the University of Maine. I am currently going to grad school here, trying to get my PhD in service sciences. I am very passionate about science and mainly computers. My first computer was an IBM, an old thing that was revolutionary for the time that left my 11 year old mind amazed. In 95, I was really into playing Doom and Wolfenstein 3D when I got home from school. My mom and dad never really got mad at me because they were always at work, so no one really told me to stop playing these violent games. My love for these games continued through the 90s, but really peaked at the beginning of 1996. I was a typical 90s kid, obsessed with Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, fanny packs, mullets, classic horror movies, and even for a stint of time, I had a Tamagotchi. With the coming of school in the fall of 96 came the sadness of not being able to play video games every day as I did in the summer. However, school did bring the joy of friends. At lunch and sometimes in class, we would talk about games and new releases that would be coming out soon. Back then, we didn't have websites dedicated to video games news. Instead, my friend group relied on Jeff, one of the more wealthy kids in our friend group, who was subscribed to a video game magazine company that sent out an issue once a month. On the last day of August, Jeff brought the latest issue to school. All of us crowded around the lunch table to catch a glimpse and saw the new system that was coming out next month, the Nintendo 64. We all were begging our parents that night to help us with money to get the system. The N64 was an amazing system as it had 4 megabytes of RAM and could handle 3D graphics like none other before. I'd saved a little money from mowing lawns in the summer, but it was not quite enough to buy the console come September 29th of that year. I was disappointed. I was disappointed and cried to my parents to help me out, just this once, to buy this great piece of technology. But my family was struggling at the time, and me being the understanding and caring child just piped down. A couple of hard months pass, and with them came many complaints and jeering from my friend group because I have still not received the console. It had been a difficult time for me. My parents were fighting and I just wanted an escape. I would have given anything for that damn console. I hated going to school and hearing all of my friends show off their high scores in the newest games and hearing about them finding secret glitches in the newest installment of our favourite games. Months after the initial release in September, November rolled around. Not exactly my favourite time of year. I don't like the transition from the pretty and orange fall leaves into the roads with slick ice and disgusting dark large piles of snow in the parking lots with dirt in them. However, there was one thing that is worth my time during that dreaded month. My birthday. 12 years old. Birthdays never really made much sense to me. It's just a celebration of the day someone is born based on a man-made unit of time that is elongated into years. Anyway, I hadn't been really looking forward to this birthday, because I knew that it wasn't going to bring around much. As I said before, my parents had been fighting, and I really didn't expect to get anything from either of them because they had been so busy with work and putting up with each other. That is why I was very, very excited to learn on the 19th of that month in 1996 
I was getting $250 for my birthday. I came home that night after school to find a letter from my mom, who had always been the more caring of the two. Hi, honey. I hope that you enjoyed your birthday today. The big one, too. Congrats. Anywho, your father and I, as you know, have been having disagreements lately. We were alerted today that there is a program for couples that have been having similar disagreements. We both agreed that we should look into this, and we both fell in love with the idea. Isn't that great, baby? Anywho, the only problem with this is that we were made aware of this at little short notice. So we had to drive south today so we could make it there by tomorrow, Wednesday. The program is going to last a week. I knew that you were our understanding and kind little boy, so I thought it would be okay to leave you alone until next Tuesday. That would give you the rest of the week and the weekend to yourself. To make up for this, me and your father have decided to give you a little spending money so you can get yourself whatever little toy you want. We do have food in the pantry, but I do want some of that money to go towards food for yourself. Enjoy your weekend, and see you Thursday. Love you. I didn't know whether to be excited about this freedom, or disappointed in my parents for leaving me on my 12th birthday. Either way, I had more than $200 to spend on whatever I wanted. To my puny 12 year old brain, this was a godlike amount of money. And I knew exactly what it was going towards right away. I'm sure by now you can assume exactly what I wanted. I took the money out of the envelope, threw on my windbreaker and my old pro wings, and hopped onto my old red bike I named Silver. I started to head east, past my dad's pharmacy, past the school, and past Jeff's house. I didn't really look over towards his house. He hadn't been in school that week. I skidded to a stop in front of the Finger Gym, a local game store, parked my bike right next to the big window in front of the store, and started to waltz in. I really liked the store, and it felt good going in knowing that I was finally able to get something instead of just glancing around while my friends debated on what new game they should get or what Magic the Gathering card they should sell. I did a quick look around of the store, eyeing the older Nez and Super Nez, making my way toward my prized jewel, the N64. I finally put my hands on the box that I'd been waiting to touch for a quarter of the year. I held it up to the light so I could read the line under the name, The Fun Machine. Damn straight it is. My finger ran over the smooth cardboard cover as I started to walk towards the counter. The kid working at the counter laid down his cigarette in the ashtray that was next to his Rubik's Cube. Now that I think about it, that probably wasn't a cigarette. I just assumed it was because I was still a small middle schooler that had a lot to learn. When I got up to the counter, he asked, Is that all? Crap, I had forgotten to get a game. I responded with a quick no and started to look behind him at the selection of games. Most of the ones that were back there were meant for the Super NES. Makes sense, the N64 had been very popular in America, so of course all its games would be sold out. I spoke after glancing around a bit more, desperately trying to find a game. Do you have any N64 games in the back? The boy took another drag and blew smoke in my face. I don't know. Well, could you go back and check for me? Uh, please? Jesus, kid, fine. He got off of his stool and started towards the back. He pushed the curtain out of the way and started to search. I looked around the store at the plentiful gaming posters and walls lined with board games and models of popular TV show action figures. The boy returned after less than a minute with a cartridge in his hand. We only have one, it looks like. He started to hand it over, but then pulled it back towards him. Ah, wait a second, what do we have here? 
He turned the cartridge over to reveal its face, only to be covered by a sticky note with the words, Do not, under any circumstances, sell. Now see here kid, I've never really been much of a rule follower, and this thing has been buried under some crap in the back so I don't think anyone will be missing this anytime soon so... He gave a wide grin to reveal its crooked teeth layered with yellow grime. I am willing to strike a deal with you. I will sell you this game for a couple extra bucks. My boss probably didn't want to sell it because it must be some limited edition or something. So I will get you this game. Just don't tell nobody, right kid? Of course, my eager little mind didn't care about what was right and wrong at the moment. There was an N64 in front of my face, for God's sake. Even with a possible limited edition game. So of course I took the grimy kid up on his deal, even though I knew he was going to pocket those extra few bucks. I waltzed out of the store the same way I came in, excited for what was about to come about, but only this time I was carrying an N64 and a game instead of $250. I put the plastic bag into the wire basket that was on the front of my bike. I don't know if I raced home faster then or when I went to the store initially. The ride home took 5 minutes. I just let the bike drop to the ground after I came to a hard stop in front of my garage. I pounced up the concrete steps leading up to my house, swung open the door, and started to my room. That night, I knew I had a lot of homework, and me, being the responsible little boy I was, didn't start playing right away. But that didn't stop me from eyeing over the box and opening it to save the beautiful system from its cardboard prison. I ran my fingers over the wondrously smooth black console like it was the skin of a newborn baby. I carefully set the console on my dresser and plugged it into my box TV. I led the wire from the infamous M-shaped controller to the port on the front of it. I was smiling through all of this, but stopped suddenly when realizing I had forgotten something. I didn't even know what game I had bought. I quickly but carefully set the controller down on my bed and removed the cartridge from the bag. I ripped off the sticky note to reveal the true face of the game. In multicolor letters read the words Super Mario 64. I felt like I had won the lottery. It didn't look any different than my friend's cartridges so I was a little upset that it wasn't actually a special edition. But nonetheless, I was still pumped. I finally got what I had been waiting for so long for. I could not wait for the weekend. Could it come any sooner? The next day, in typical middle school boy fashion, I showed off my new game to my friends and rubbed it into the faces of the others who were not fortunate enough to have the system or game. I was on top of the world for that day, just because of that stupid video game. My friends were happy for me, of course, and we talked about the game and how long it took to beat. I played with my friends at their house after school and watched them play the game for hours and hours. I didn't want to start to play my own copy yet because it acted as an incentive for me to get through the week. But boy, coming home and seeing it sitting on my dresser and glaring at it in the wee hours of the night was mighty tempting. But nevertheless, I persisted. I made it through the whole week. That Friday, the 22nd of November, I raced home after school to finally play my new game all night. I dropped my bike off in front of my house, opened the door and closed it again to lock, threw off my jacket and hat, and finally made my way to my sanctuary. I turned on the TV and slipped the grey cartridge into the slot on top of the machine. It's me, Mario! Hello! Damn, what a feeling. I turned on the system, saw the N64 3D logo arise from a ripple of some liquid, and start to turn. 
with a little 3D Mario running around it. The game started, and I finally started to play. I was already familiar with the castle at the start, so I thought I knew what was waiting for me. I made a new save file, started the game, and the camera started to move toward Princess Peach's face. But something was already off. At first, I thought I had just bought a knockoff, a fake game. Maybe that's why it wasn't meant to be sold. At the beginning, there was supposed to be a letter from Princess Peach that read, Dear Mario, please come to the castle. I've baked a cake for you. Yours truly, Princess Toadstool. With a signature, Peach, underneath it. But what appeared to me that Friday, next to Peach's face, was a letter that read, Dear player, you don't know what you're getting into. Turn off your system now and get help. Yours truly, the previous owner. Okay, that was odd. How had the previous person changed the text in the game? Either way, at the time, I was too excited to play the game that the mysterious text didn't faze me at all. I just kept going. I ran up to the castle, walked in, and jumped into the first portrait. I watched Mario fall from the sky and land perfectly on the ground. Toad was waiting for me to relay information about the level. His speech said, You will die if you continue. Turn off the game or I will kill you. Creepy as all hell. But I just thought some hacker had the game before me and just changed the text because they wanted to scare the kid who had it next. I just kept hitting the main button until the text disappeared and continued. I was reassured when I found that the gameplay had been the same as all of my other friends. I jumped around the level and evaded the mushroom enemies the same as I had done before. I made my way around the level, collecting spinning red coins and hopping off trees. I shot myself out of a cannon and flew up to the top of the mountain to fight the final boss of that level. After that, I was walked back to the starting area in the castle. I made my way through the next few levels. The water levels, the levels in the mountains, the snow. I kept going until I collected 18 stars. I knew where to go for my first fight with Bowser. And of course, I wasn't surprised when Mario dropped through the floor because I had seen it done a thousand times before. He landed on the rock and a text bubble appeared. Welcome to hell. Huh? That was... something new. Must have been something the hacker had put in to scare me again. I jumped around the level and evaded the flames until I reached the end of my first encounter with Mario's infamous enemy. But when Bowser turned around, something else was different. The large turtle-dragon hybrid had eyes that looked like black holes. The entirety of them were black, not a single pixel of white being shown. But I just passed it off again and continued. I beat the boss easily and was warped back up to the castle. But in the corner of the screen, right before the scene transitioned into the castle intro, I saw Bowser get up. He moved away towards the edge of the map and shapeshift into a tall, black humanoid figure. The only thing that the new entity had that resembled the original Bowser were the long, pointed teeth protruding from his mouth. I was very freaked out at this point, and I was reluctant to get out of the map. At first, I thought the game had glitched, but for some reason, I was in a part of the castle that I shouldn't have been in until later in the game. Looking up, for as far as Mario could see, was the endless hallway. Now, I'm sure some of you know what I'm referring to. You couldn't even access the area without having the right number of stars. Also, those who have played the game 
know that when you start to walk up the stairs, it seems like they go on forever. Unless you know the backwards jump glitch, or have the right number of stars, of course. I was excited at this point. I had forgotten about the strangeness of the game for a brief few minutes. I made it this far in one day? I would have to show my friends so they would know how good I was and how dedicated I am to the game. The only thing that could make the situation better was if I could actually make it to the top of the stairs. I placed Mario's little foot on the first step and started to ascend. After a few minutes of still climbing the stairs, I was about to give up. But then I remembered something. There should be pictures of Bowser on the side of the walls leading to the top. But I haven't seen anything. Immediately after I had that thought, I saw the edge of a frame. I jumped up the stairs to get there quicker and landed in front of the picture. To my horror, I saw a very familiar image. Sitting on a rock was six-year-old me with my old dog who had died, Lassie. I was very shaken up by this. All of my other excuses for the strange events held no weight now. This just couldn't be explained away. Of course, my curiosity told me to continue. I started ascending again, only to find more familiar pictures. I walked past the plethora of photos, all of which were of me and my family. Not only were the photos themselves familiar, but the order they were in were hauntingly similar to the ones leading up the staircase to our second level. Remember, this was very early Saturday morning, around 2 or 3 a.m., so my parents weren't supposed to be home yet. But I swear, I heard something on the steps outside of my door. This couldn't be possible. I turned around to look, but was only greeted by the darkness outside of my room. I looked back towards the screen to continue to play my game. I started to slowly creep back up the stairs, and while I did that, I heard more noise outside the room. Now, I was scared witless. I dropped the controller and bolted to the door. I grabbed the handle and swung it shut, causing the frame and most of my room to vibrate. I fumbled in the dark with a lock until I heard it click. I pressed my back against the door and let out a deep breath. Mario was still waiting for me. I went back to the game, hoping that it was just the restlessness getting to my mind. I just wanted to keep playing my game. I just wanted my game and my childhood to be normal like everyone else's. I turned Mario around and started to creep down the stairs in the game. Luckily, I didn't hear anything on the stairs again. I continued down the stairs, listening to the stairs moan in the game, but not outside my bedroom, thank God. I was wiping the sleep away from my eyes when I put my controller down for a second or two. I removed my hands and stretched a bit, letting out a long yawn. I opened my eyes to be greeted with Mario staring back at me. But only now, his eyes were as black as Bowser's were. I couldn't take any more of this. I brought the stick of the joypad down so that Mario could get away from that damn staircase. He started walking, slower than before, with his eyes still dark as night, staring into me. He gradually started to slow down, and I began mashing buttons, trying to get Mario to move just one more inch. But he just stood there. Finally, the character brought up his index finger on his right hand and shook it back and forth, along with his head. He then brought the corners of his mouth back towards his ears in a grotesque smile. 
He opened his mouth to reveal teeth that resembled Bowser's. I was beyond trying to convince myself that this wasn't real at this point. Mario turned around and started sprinting up the steps. Along with the steps in the game, I heard a pouncing sound outside my room again. I jumped up and went to my bedside. Whatever was outside of my room had finally reached the top of the stairs and stopped. I stood in awe for a few seconds, trying to think of what to do. It started to bang on my door, shaking the frame and sent splinters on my side. I crouched and crawled under my bed. I looked up to watch the door. I was shaking. Whatever was out there kept pounding on the door and wall. After about five more seconds, it stopped. I removed my hand from in front of my face to see what was going on. I looked left and right and saw nothing. I let out a relieved breath. I crawled out a bit more to peek around the corner. I looked at my TV screen to see that Mario was looking in the opposite direction in the game, still standing in front of the final door. Mario put his hand on the door, and at the same time, I heard my door creak a little bit. I was so glad I had locked it. Mario removed his hand and turned to his left to look at one final portrait. This was one I was not familiar with. I have not seen it in the game, nor in my real life. It was a picture of a television set. Mario put his hand on the portrait, and it began to ripple like the other portraits previously when going into a new level. When it touched it, my TV began to crinkle with static. I could barely make out Mario through the white noise as he removed his hand. Everything went back to normal. He took a final look to his left, stared straight into my soul, and opened his mouth for another one of those smiles. He shoved himself into the portrait. My TV emitted the loudest static noise I had heard. It then began to ripple and shake. The screen shattered and sparks flew from the back of the set. I didn't have time to see what was crawling out of its remains. I rolled out from under my bed and started towards the window. I ducked down and hit my shoulder against the window. The glass shattered and I flung my body out of my room as the set continued to spark and set my drapes ablaze. I hit my roof and tumbled down. The last thing I thought about before rolling off and smashing my head against the concrete sidewalk was the snow. It was the first snowfall of the winter, and I'd missed watching it because I was too distracted by the game. I woke up that Wednesday in the hospital and saw my parents and a nurse next to me. They caught me up on everything that had went down. The house had caught on fire for some unknown reason and was done for. We would be living in a hotel for the next few weeks until we found a place to rent. I had a nice long break. I didn't have to go to school for a while because of Thanksgiving break and because of my nasty head injury. I did, of course, have to return to my educational hell about three weeks later, right before Christmas break, which I'd been looking forward to as well. I returned and continued throughout my classes with little to no struggle. Teachers were going easy on me. Who would give a kid whose house burned down, sustained a head injury, and whose parents were going through a divorce stressful hours of homework? Returning to school did bring about the joy of my friend's company, however. My friends jumped on me with a ton of questions about my house. I remembered nothing. I got questions about my game after that, of course, too. I didn't tell them exactly what happened, because I knew they wouldn't believe me. I just gave short and quick answers 
so they would stop pestering me. Then they brought up Jeff. He had been playing the game down in his basement while his parents were away during the week. Now, I don't know if this is true, but the gang told me that Jeff's parents had returned home to find Jeff under the steps leading to the basement, hanging by the cord of his N64 controller. They told me that the police told his folks it wasn't a suicide due to the head wounds and gouged out eyes. But it hadn't been ruled as murder either because there were no signs of struggle. Jeff's dad, they told me, had sold his N64 and copy of Super Mario 64 to the finger gym to get the reminder out of their house. <laughs>